Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've met so many nice people to be here, and I really appreciate uh, Pomona Valley's uh, opportunity to have me uh, here. Uh, we're going to be talking about ICD-10. Uh, are there any orthopedists that, that with whom I spoke yesterday? One, you're going to hear some of this same stuff again, but so if you want to doze off, you're the only one that's allowed to. We're going to be talking about ICD-10, but there's so much more going on than that, and it all relates back to ICD-10. We're going to be talking about risk adjustments and how important they've become, what they are, and how they're used. Quality and cost efficiency analysis. All physicians are going to be evaluated for quality and cost efficiency, and we're going to see how they do that. Uh, the reimbursement environment is changing. And we're going to talk about uh, the literature review <clears throat> and conditions as physicians define them in the literature and the thresholds between severities of illness within uh, conditions. Those are particularly important to us uh, and the language that we use to get credit for what we do and the role of the clinical documentation integrity team to help us accomplish all of the aforementioned. Well, ICD-10 is coming on October the 1st. Uh, there's a big dramatic increase in the number of codes. We're going from about 15,000 diagnostic codes to almost 70,000. And when that was announced, it created a big hubbub. The, the, the massive increase in the number of codes, the, the issue of that has uh, dropped off a bit, and we'll understand that a bit more uh, uh, as we go along. <clears throat> A year ago, it was supposed to have been implemented, but it was delayed with uh, five lines uh, within a 200-page uh, law that was tied to the Medicare sustained growth rate uh, fix, what they called the DOC fix. There was never anything wrong with the DOCs. It was the Medicare fix. But they've, uh, they've permanently corrected that, and the subject of delaying ICD-10 further did not come up. So we're, we're good to go. The American Medical Association has even dropped its opposition to the implementation of ICD-10. Now, one thing they have announced is that they're going to have a grace period of a year uh, where they won't penalize us for errors that we make in uh, production of ICD-10 codes. Uh, haven't heard a lot of details about that, so I remain a bit suspicious. Half of the increase in the number of codes just has to do with the musculoskeletal system. A full third of that is just left and right. I think we've got that. You know, so when you add a left, you have to add a right. For a number of things, there's bilateral. And then for, there's an, even an unspecified option for a lot of things. We want to uh, exercise caution with the use of that because if the insurance companies know that we know if it's left or right and we don't say so, it gives them an excuse to not pay the claim. So here is, uh, you know, the ICD-9 code structure. Uh, it's a, it's a five-digit code. Picture, uh, this will be easy for you, a five-lane Southern California highway that's just clogged. It's full. There's not any more room. ICD-10 is a seven-digit code, and many of these characters can be letters or numbers, which gives, uh, for each one, 34 options. So it's like having a 34-layered highway, much more, much more room to, to expand. In ICD-10, the, the procedure codes have been separated from the diagnostic codes, uh, but the diagnostic codes are required by law to be used for every diagnosis that's produced, regardless of where it's produced. Uh, inpatients, outpatients, offices, all the diagnoses have to be coded in ICD-10. The procedure coding system is only used by the hospitals and then only for inpatients. So you don't use the PCS codes in your office, we don't use them in same day surgery, or even when they're in the hospital in observation status, we don't use the PCS codes. They're only used by the hospital for inpatients. Now, with this one caveat, if a patient undergoes a procedure and then is hospitalized as an inpatient within three days of that procedure, the hospital is required to code it in PCS and bill it in PCS. CPT does not change at all. Uh, we bill in the office in CPT, we bill procedures and visits in the hospital in CPT. That does not change. What will be changing is how much money you get back from Medicare based on those CPT codes, and uh, we're going to talk about that very soon. The ICD-10 began in the late 1800s as the International Classification of Causes of Death. The World Health Organization became, became involved just after World War II and has been since. ICD-9, <clears throat> the version that we're using now, was released by the World Health Organization in 1977. 
That's the year that there was this rumor that Elvis had died. That's when that rumor started. Uh, John Travolta uh, was in Saturday Night Fever. And there's going to be a new Star Wars movie coming out this year. It's the seventh, I think. That was the year of the first one. Chevrolet was still producing the Vega. This is a long time ago. The World Health Organization uh, produced ICD-10 in 1993. That's 18 years ago. And there are versions of uh, ICD-10. Uh, the World Health Organization version is used by about 115 countries just right out of the box. The United States has its own version of ICD-10 identified as dash CM. The CM stands for clinical modification. Why they couldn't call it dash US, I don't know. Canada's is dash CA, Russia's is dash RU, uh, China has one, I'm not sure what symbol they use for that. But these are the years that the World Health Organization released theirs, and, and there's been this lag for us creating our own version. We're 18 years uh, down the line from uh, the World Health Organization with that. And we are the last country to adopt, the last industrialized country to adopt ICD-10. The countries that you see in blue have already adopted it. We are the only country to tie it to billing and reimbursement. So it makes it even more imperative that we get this right from the beginning. So the U.S. has its own version. Well, who wrote the United States version? Uh, they're called the four cooperating parties. Uh, the diagnosis codes are produced by the CDC. The procedure codes are produced by Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and if those are as if law, then the American Hospital Association functions as if the Supreme Court to interpret issues that arise in application of these guidelines. And they, they publish those interpretations in the coding clinic, uh, which is available by subscription uh, for $1,200 a year, if anybody's interested in that. Uh, it's not in your medical library. It's not in Vanderbilt's medical library. Uh, the coders have access to it on their computer terminals. <clears throat> but. Uh, you may notice that there's a, a, a body of professionals very interested in healthcare, very active actually in healthcare, not re represented among these four groups. Anybody notice who's missing? There are no doctors. There are no doctors. So, you know, what they say when, when you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> and they, they say they take advice from you know, professional medical societies and stuff, but we're going to see some examples as we go uh, in the application of relative weight credit for certain diagnoses. There are terms that we use all the time that they just give no credit for. Uh, and, and there are terms they give credit for, and we're kind of scratching your head, and, well, how did they come to that? So, so the translation from our medical language into this administrative language is uh, sometimes problematic. So why do we even care about all of this? Well, we're being graded now for quality of care and cost efficiency of care. And those assessments have been available to the insurers for a long time. I don't know if anybody noticed about a year and a half ago, United Healthcare dumped thousands of doctors off their provider roles. And they did that on the basis of an assessment that they were not cost efficient. They may have been or may not have been. We'll see how uh, that uh, determination can be a bit ambiguous. But these assessments are going to be increasingly available to the public. And these assessments are going to be increasingly linked to reimbursements, not just from Medicare, but from private payers as well. So it's important that we understand this. So uh, what's your favorite radio station? I listened to KFI when I uh, uh, was uh, leaving the airport. Uh, but it's not my favorite radio station. Mine is WIIFM. What's in it for me? I want to know what's in it for me. Not out of greed. Greed is self-interest you know, on steroids that actually hurts other people. We just want to do what's best for our family, for our practice, for our hospitals. So that's why I, that, I listen to that radio station. Uh, this is a table reproduced from JAMA, uh, produced originally by CMS. And it kind of gives the, the going down in time how they anticipate healthcare reimbursements going to change. Where we have been, a fee for service, no link to quality, it's just volume related. See patient, send bill, get checked. 
what they're going to now is tying at least a portion of reimbursements to both quality and cost efficiency. And down the line, there'll be accountable care organizations, uh, patient-centered medical homes, bundle payments, which we're going to talk about, and eventually the ultimate bundle where you just get a certain amount of money to care for a patient for a year and that's it, don't ask for any more. But now in tying quality and efficiency to reimbursement, they're using the physician value-based purchasing modifier. <clears throat> But all of these methodologies are grounded in the diagnostic codes of ICD-9 and ICD-10, and we're going to see how that works. So how do they get information from our patient care? Uh, well, from office records, it comes through the physician quality reporting system. Uh, from a hospitalized patient, it comes from claims data. So they're not looking at your charts. They're not talking to your patients, each of whom loves you, I'm sure. They're looking at your billing records. Uh, the billing records has all the ICD-9 codes that describes your patient's principal diagnosis and all the secondary diagnoses. They know how many days the patient was in the hospital and how much uh, we spent taking care of them. And, and they look at those accumulated ICD-9 codes to get an idea of the severity of illness of the patient, the complexity of their care, and then they compare that to how much was spent to get there and it gives them an, a, a concept of cost efficiency. Now, this is a screenshot taken from the Medicare.gov website. Uh, right now, it's mostly just a directory, but very soon they're going to have this quality and cost efficiency data next to your name, uh, where now it just has office address and phone numbers. And these are some, these are, uh, some of my friends in Nashville, uh, Deb Beyer, uh, our kids carpooled when they were young to school together. Uh, my son just graduated from business school at NYU, so that's, we've known each other a long time. Angelo Canonico uh, was one of my medical school classmates, and Charlie Daniels, he just plays a mean fiddle. This is a different Charlie Daniels. He's actually a doctor. <clears throat> now, uh, so this is a public representation of our quality and cost efficiency. There's also a confidential report uh, that's much more detailed uh, about your quality of care, and that's called the Quality Resource Use Report, or the QRUR. Who's heard of that? Good. I, oh, you've heard of it. Oh, crap, that just destroys the trend. Nobody had ever heard of it before. Hats off to you. <clears throat> if I had a prize... I'd give it to you, but... Now, they're going to grade each physician as either high, average, or low for both cost and quality. And that's going to come from the same inf information as uh, we've been talking about. Now, with the uh, physician value-based purchasing modifier, they are implementing these adjustments of reimbursement uh, gradually based on how big the group is in which you practice. Uh, for People in the mega groups that have a hundred or more members, including nurse practitioners and PAs that all bill together, their, their uh, payments are being adjusted now. That started January of this year. Uh, and for groups between size 10 and 100, that will be implemented January of next year. And then in 2017, it'll include everybody. And they look at records uh, from the two years prior. So if you're in a group less than 10, <clears throat> They just started looking at your records January of this year. So, so you have an opportunity to, to beef up the documentation to get your scores up. And we'll, uh, during the course of this week and next week, as I speak to individual specialty groups, we'll get into the nitty gritty of, of how uh, you can make yourself look good. Because <clears throat> uh, this is not a quality of care issue. The quality of your care is good. We're talking about actually getting credit for what you do. <clears throat> So, if one is judged to be a high quality and low cost physician, then you'll be in a position to get a 4% increase in your reimbursements from Medicare. Where's this money coming from? Well, it's coming from these doctors that are deemed to be low quality and high cost. They're taking it away from them. And these are the diagnoses that they're looking at to establish these parameters. COPD, emphysema, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and diabetes. Now, a lot of you are not primary care people, but uh, uh, we're all taking care of people that have these things. Now, all that being said, the physician quality reporting system, the information in, the physician uh, value-based purchasing modifier adjustments of reimbursements back to us, and the meaningful use of electronic health records, a concept I'm sure uh, you've heard about, 
the, as separate entities, they're going away at the end of 2017, but they're not gone. They're being consolidated in this program called the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS. You're going to start hearing a lot about MIPS. And they're going to grade each of us, give us scores between 0 and 100 in each of these four categories, quality of care, meaningful use of electronic health records, use of health care resources, another word for cost efficiency, how much money do we spend on testing and imaging and the like, and then activities undertaken to improve clinical practice. Uh, for example, if you're a primary care physician and your patient has asthma, it's not just keeping them out of the hospital, it's keeping them out of the emergency department. So if, if, if you know that, if they know that they are exacerbated by pet dander and they're going over to somebody's house that has pets, you know, to teach them to pre-treat, and if they get exacerbated, you know, how to manage that and take a few prednisone tablets and that sort of thing to try to keep them even out of the emergency department. So, by the time we get to 2018, we'll have the 4% carrot and the 4% stick, but by the end of 2021, which sounds like forever from now, but it's only six years away, five and a half now, they can take away as much as 9% from your reimbursements and, and boost it, the law says, by not more than 10%. So if you have an office practice and your overhead's 50%, if they end up chopping 9% out of your uh, reimbursements, you know, your overhead's not going anywhere, so your take-home pay is going to go down 18%. We do not wish this to happen. Now, a bit about risk adjustment. You all know risk adjustment. That's, uh, that's why a life insurance policy for a 16-year-old costs less than a 60-year-old that smokes three packs a day. So we're interested in risk-adjusted outcomes, and we get those by comparing observed outcomes versus expected outcomes. And you can observe anything, mortality, length of stay, how much we spend on medicines, imaging, post-op infections, readmission. You can take what's observed versus what's expected, risk-adjusted outcomes, and then you compare that to how much money we spent to get there, and you get an idea of cost efficiency. That's basically how they're doing this. So, the observed metric is easy enough to identify. That's what's on our records. Uh, it's this area that most quality improvement programs have uh, addressed to try to improve care in that aspect. But where does this expected group come from? How do they know who to compare my care to? Well, these are other physicians, patients, uh, with similar demographics and characteristics of age, principal, secondary diagnosis, and procedures that have to do with the, uh, the metric that we're measuring. And so, if the height of this bracket represents my patient's true, total, complete severity of illness, complexity of illness, but the height of this bracket represents what the coders can code and thus report and tell the world how sick my patient is based on the documentation I provide the coder, then, then we've got a problem. This documentation gap is the difference between my patient's true severity of illness and how that gets represented, and it's based entirely on the language I use in my documentation, and how that gets to be translated into the administrative language of ICD-9 and ICD-10. So this pool of other patients to whom my care is compared depends not on how sick my patient is, it depends on how sick my patient looks on paper to the coder. And that's based on what I write in my emergency medicine note, what you write in the H&P, progress note, op note, and most importantly, the discharge summary. Because that's the last record uh, uh, for the attending to describe how the patient presented, what conditions we identified, how we intervene, how they responded, and how we expect the post-hospital phase to go. Discharge summary is the most important document. So when we close this gap, we're going to reduce denials and downcoding uh, based on an inadequate representation of the medical necessity for the procedures and services that we provide. And medical necessity, you know, is what the insurance companies thinks is medically necessary, not what we as doctors think is necessary. And by closing this gap, our quality portrayals will be accurate. Our cost efficiency portrayals will be accurate and we'll be a long way down the road toward the specificity required for ICD-10. 
A little more about background definitions. The principal diagnosis is that condition established after study, may not be apparent on the front end, but that condition established after study that's principally responsible for the patient being admitted to an inpatient to the hospital. Secondary diagnoses, also called comorbidities, are anything that meets any one of these other criteria, anything that requires clinical evaluation, uh, anything that requires therapeutic treatment. So if somebody comes in uh, taking 15 micrograms of Synthroid a day, that's therapeutic treatment. So the fact that they have hypothyroidism needs to be on the list of secondary diagnoses. Anything that requires a diagnostic procedure extends the length of the hospital stay or requires increased nursing care or monitoring. Anything that fits any one or more of these classifies as a secondary diagnosis or a comorbidity. And obviously procedures. Now it's these three elements, the principal diagnosis, secondary, and procedures that comprise the diagnostic related group, the DRG, that goes toward what determines the hospital gets reimbursed for care. We as doctors used to not care about that because that was just the hospital. Well, I mean, you know, we care, but, you know, we don't really care. But, but now we care, because it's these same elements that, that they're using to judge us for quality of care and cost efficiency of care. So we, it's time that we understand how this works. There are several different methodologies that translate our med speak into administrative speak. These are three that are, are most prominent in our practices. The MSDRGs, the Medicare Severity uh, Diagnostic Related Group, obviously used by Medicare for inpatients only. APR DRGs, all patient refined DRGs, is used by Medi-Cal and, and most states, Medicaid services. And then the hierarchical condition categories, or HC, HCCs, uh, which are just exploding in importance, and we're going to learn about these. These are, these are languages that are used for billing and reimbursement, statistical analysis, quality analysis, and cost efficiency analysis, but they're all designed to communicate the patient's severity of illness. Now looking a little more closely at the MSDRGs, for secondary diagnoses, the principal diagnosis is what it is, for all those secondary diagnoses, they stratify them in a, within a three-tiered system of, that represents the severity. And the thresholds revolve around a term we call a CC. One C stands for a comorbidities, those secondary diagnoses that a patient brings with them to the hospital. Everything we identify before the inpatient order is written uh, is a comorbidity. So all of their, their chronic diseases of hypertension, lupus, uh, emphysema, diabetes, and the acute things they bring to the hospital, their pneumonia, fractures, heart attack, those things that we identify before the inpatient order is written. The other C stands for complications. And that's just a temporal relationship with the, in, the timing of the inpatient order. All things that arise anew after the inpatient order uh, is written is classified as a complication in the MSDRG system. And then, and so those are the CCs. An MCC is just a major one of those. So the three tiers are MCC, CC, and then neither one. And when it's neither one, you get no increased relative weight credit for that at all. Uh, for a CC, you get a modest increased relative weight. For the MCC, you get a lot of increased uh, relative weight for that. Uh, within the APR DRG system, what Medi-Cal uses, there are uh, there are two categories, and it's a four-tiered system. Uh, one category is called severity of illness. The other is risk of mortality. Each has a number between one, not sick, and four, very, very sick. Uh, and the numbers don't have to be the same. You can have a prominent severity of illness and not much risk of mortality, so the numbers don't have to be the same. The HCCs, the hierarchical condition categories, identify the patient's severity of illness uh, by, by integers and fractions thereof uh, for each secondary diagnosis, and they're all added together to give a total number that represents the patient's uh, uh, severity of illness. And these are also called outpatient DRGs. The MSDRGs, Medicare, and, and private payers, a lot of, most of them use MSDRGs. APR DRGs used by Medi-Cal, these are both for inpatient diagnoses. The HCCs accumulate ICD-9 codes regardless of whether they uh, uh, originate in uh, an inpatient setting or an outpatient setting. 
Now this is a table that identifies the three-tiered system within the MSDRG in the far left column, uh, no credit at all for that. Uh, the middle column, modest increased relative weight for the CCs. In the far right column, major increased relative weight. And I have selected these two uh, conditions specifically because in my more than quarter year practice of emergency medicine, these were two of my favorite terms. I had absolutely no idea I was getting no credit for them. It just blew me away when I realized that. But after I've come, you know, to learn and, and, and humbly acknowledge, you know, that I, I, it's, I'm understanding. Uh, a mental status is like a nose. Everybody's got one. Altered nose is not a diagnosis. Neither is altered mental status. Gives you no clue as to why mental status is altered. I could go to Buffalo Wild Wings tonight and get my mental status altered. But if we name the alteration like a delirium, then we get increased credit for that. If somebody has a sodium of 118 and they have a delirium due to that, well, that's a metabolic encephalopathy. We get huge credit for that. So we have to come to understand how the system identifies relative weight. So when our patient has legitimately one of these conditions, we name it in a fashion so we get credit for it. Unresponsive is your daughter when she's mad at you. If you call home and you, our daughter is unresponsive, you're going to say, well, what's she upset about today? But if you call home and hear she's in a coma or unconscious, ooh, that felt different, didn't it? Okay? <clears throat> so we get no credit for these terms. We get big credit for these terms. Uh, when I was born and we admitted a patient to the hospital with an exacerbation of heart failure, you know, the diagnosis was CHF. Everybody knew they had heart failure and it got worse. They had to be in the heart hospital. Well, the current system of coding makes no such assumption. Uh, because the patient had heart failure last week, they weren't in the hospital, so what's different? Well, they had an acute exacerbation of heart failure. And now they want to know the functional status too, whether it's systolic, diastolic, or combined. Well, this is not even the nomenclature that the cardiologists like to use now. They like to use uh, heart failure with, with reduced ejection fraction. And that's nice, but that's over here where there's no credit for it because the coding system hadn't caught up to that yet. So we have to say whether it's systolic, diastolic, or combined, and if it is an acute decompensation, use the word acute because uh, they had heart failure last week, they weren't in the hospital, and they want to know. So symptom codes, we get no credit for. Uh, when we add functionality and specificity, we get increased credit. Uh, when we add acuity, we get more increased credit. The hierarchical condition categories, uh, inpatient and outpatient origin, uh, a, an average person of average health will have a risk of, total risk adjustment factor of around one, uh, but someone with a lot of things going on with them will have lots of fractions add up and their number will be bigger. Now, here's why this is so important to us. Here's why this is important. This is the methodology that they use, the HCC methodology for the, the physician value-based purchasing mod modifier. This is what they're using to adjust our reimbursements. This is what the Medicare system uses to identify its cost per beneficiary. And this is the system they use to fund accountable care organizations and independent practice organizations. So we really want to understand this. And this is a table that looks pretty busy, but it's, it's all about one patient, a 65-year-old female who's got some things going on in her life. She's got breast cancer that's metastasized to the bone. She's malnourished, and she has uh, pressure ulcers. Now, you'll notice that this says it's based on calendar year codes because the HCC codes expire at the end of every year and they have to be renewed. The reason they did that was to try to provide an incentive for somebody to see this person every year. If that does not happen, then we get just the, the baseline rate for her demographic, which is a 65-year-old female, uh, so that's a relative weight of 0.3, so you multiply that by the, uh, the base rate, which is around $10,000, so we've got about $3,000 to take care of her next year. But let's look at the rel relative weights for everything else that's going on with her. Cancer of the breast is more than three times the relative weight of her baseline demographic. Uh, when it metastasizes, it doubles yet again, and she's sick, so she's malnourished much increased relative weight there. 
a stage three pressure ulcer, stage four pressure ulcer. So when we add all of these together and multiply that by our base rate, we've got almost $60,000 in the bucket to take care of her next year. So when she comes into the hospital and they consult you to take care of her and you're dipping your ladle into the bucket of reimbursement, which bucket you wanna be dipping into? I wanna be in this deep one down over here. <clears throat> so that's why these are important. Now you notice history of breast cancer has no relative weight at all. It's just goose eggs. Well, why is that? Well, this highlights uh, our ambiguous use of the phrase history of. I have a history of strep throat, but I do not now have strep throat, nor do I have any sequelae of strep throat. So if you had history of breast cancer, what the coding system does is when we use the term history of, they think, yes, they had this, but they do not have it now, and we're not doing anything at all to treat it. So we're not expending any resources, so we're not getting any resources. So they want us to use the phrase history of when we're not uh, actually treating the condition at all. So if someone has breast cancer, has a lumpectomy, some radiation therapy, and is on tamoxifen for five or 10 years, then we're actively treating that, so that wouldn't be this. But once we take off the medication at all, we don't wanna lose this diagnosis because history of breast cancer, breast cancer can sometimes uh, flare back up. So we wanna keep it on the problem list, but we're not getting any, any credit for it. So some important concepts uh, uh, in ICD-10. Acuity, we've talked about that. Uh, anatomic specificity, there's not just malignancy of the lung now, we have left, right, specific lobes, uh, and whether it overlaps lobes. Lateralization, left, right, I, I think we got that. Episodes of care is a new concept, and it's either initial, subsequent, or sequelae. The initial codes are attached to the active treatment phase, so anything during the first hospitalization. Uh, the subsequent code, and it's just the last digit on that seven digit uh, ICD-10 code changes. The subsequent code is applied during the healing phase. And the sequelae codes are used when the healing process is totally complete, but something arises that's related to the original incident, and it will get that. So, for example, if somebody has a burn uh, that's completely healed, but they have a contracture that needs to be released, then the sequelae code will be uh, applied to that. Combination codes, the fast food industry is way ahead of us on this. You go into any McDonald's and order a number one, and you're going to get a, a list. Uh, they don't write out, you know, two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onion, sesame seed bun every time you go in and order a Big Mac, which is kind of what they've been expecting us to do. Present on admission identification, very important. There's a list of things that if they happen after the inpatient order is written, like DVTs, pulmonary emboli, things like that, uh, uh, pressure ulcers of stage three or four, if they, if they happen after the inpatient order is written, we get dinged for them. And where they might be on the table at the level of a secondary diagnosis severity of a CC or even an MCC, uh, if they're on that list of hospital acquired conditions, we don't get credit for that. The hospital doesn't get increased reimbursement for that. We all have to eat that. So it's very important to, to note when things are present on admission, most of the time it's obvious. For every diagnosis, the coders have to declare whether it was present on admission or not. Uh, they very seldom have to query you for that because most of the time it's obvious, but, uh, but for certain things they may because it's, uh, it's very important. Acuity, acute versus chronic versus acute on chronic. We talked about heart failure and how uh, you get some increased credit for chronic heart failure that's not in acute exacerbation because it may make you be more mindful of fluid volumes and status and the like. But if there's an acute exacerbation, whether it's de novo or acute on chronic, it major increased relative weight for that. But if we don't specify anything, we get no increased relative weight for that. This table is just to identify the fact that by throwing the word acute in front of something doesn't always get us increased relative weight. Uh, acute bronchitis is just not that resource intensive, so even when bronchitis is acute, we don't get any increased relative weight for that. Laterality, localization, combination codes, uh, in this instance of malignant neoplasm, left, right, different lobes, overlapping lobes, but when we don't use any anatomic specificity, we don't even get the most minimal 
uh, relative weight assigned to that. Requirement for laterality. We are concerned that if we know if something is left or right and we don't say so, it will give the, the payers an opportunity to not pay the claim. Now Medicare says that they will give a year grace period uh, for errors in coding. Uh, this may be one of the things that they have in mind. I'm not sure if the privates are going to be so generous with that. Episodes of care, we talked about the initial encounter, subsequent encounter during the healing and recovery phase and sequelae after the healing process. Uh, this slide is here to remind me that those of you who have office practices, there's a CPT code for your initial encounter with the patient or your office practices initial encounter with the patient. This is not that. This is different. This has to do with the patient's phase of healing not the physician's encounter with the patient. So CPT does not change. You'll still use those uh, initial encounter codes with that. So uh, just getting into a little clinical examples of how these classifications are important to you. Uh, simple pneumonia versus complex pneumonias. The, the coding system calls the complex pneumonias respiratory infections and inflammation. The simple pneumonias are the community acquired pneumonias uh, and the like. But uh, the respiratory infections and inflammations include things like the gram negatives, Legionella, staph, whether it's methicillin sensitive or resistant, TB, fungi, aspiration, which is probably the most common cause of complex pneumonia that I've seen in my practice, uh, empyemas, mediastinitis, and lung abscesses. But notice that the relative weight for the complex pneumonias is 60% higher than uh, for simple pneumonias. And this is just a list of, of risk factors for higher weighted pneumonias. An interesting thing about ICD-10 is that with pneumonias, the codes are based on the organisms causing pneumonia, not the, the anatomic location of the pneumonia, left or right, upper lobe, lower lobe. Uh, but we hardly ever know what organism is actually causing the infection. So, so how, how can we deal with that? <clears throat> Well, we sort of declare what we think the causative organism is by the antibiotic that we select to treat it. Simple pneumonias, uh, Rocephin, Zithromax, uh, to cover the atypicals, or, or Levoquin, or the more complex pneumonias, if we think somebody has MRSA, we're going to use uh, a gorillacillin or, or uh, a vancomycin. If we think someone may have aspirated, we're going to cover the anaerobic oral flora with uh, unison and the like. So we sort of declare what we think might be the causative organism by the antibiotics that we select. Most of the initial treatment is, is empiric, but uh, we can use this information at the time of discharge by using a qualifying term like possible aspiration pneumonia, probable aspiration, or possible pseudomonas. And if we use this qualifying term at the time of discharge, for inpatient admissions, then the coders can code that as if it were established in fact. Does not help us in the office practice, does not help us in the emergency department when we send the patient home, but it helps uh, when the, the patient is in inpatient status, we can qualify the diagnosis at the time of discharge as possible, probable, suspected, or still to be ruled out, and the, con the coder can code it as if it were established in fact. But it has to be declared at the time of discharge, either in the discharge summary or on the discharge order or the last progress note. So this can be very advantageous. Well, let's look how this might work for us. These are the seven possibilities for DRGs for someone with pneumonia. The simple pneumonias are in the, the blue, the complex pneumonias in the, the lighter background. And let's just look at the ones that have no secondary diagnosis at all uh, with any increased relative weight. The, the base relative weight for simple pneumonia, 0.7 and change. For the complex pneumonia, 0.96. Well, let's look at, uh, at what that does for the increased length of stay. For simple pneumonia, 2.9 days. For complex pneumonia, 3.7. So if I have my patient in the hospital for three days, and it codes out as a simple pneumonia, I don't look so hot because I exceeded the expected length of stay. Not by much. But if it codes out as a complex pneumonia, I look great because I got them out early. That's how this works. That's how they're going to judge us. It's just that simple. <clears throat> now, what if the patient has sepsis? 
Well, the relative weight just goes up dramatically. And look, all these magically appearing increased days of expected length of stay. As we are able to successfully and accurately describe our patient's condition as more and more severe, these are some of the benefits that uh, go along with that. So how do we diagnose sepsis? Uh, this is from the 2012 Surviving Sepsis Literature. And these experts have decided that you have to have an infection that's either documented or suspected and some of the following. Well, it sounds like Monty Python is right in the subtitle here. Uh, so, you know, temperature too high or too low, uh, heart rate uh, of tachycardia, tachypnea, altered mental status, which we already know is not sufficient. You know, in this setting, it would be encephalopathy of sepsis, which is an instant secondary diagnosis at the highest level of an MCC. Fluid imbalance, hyperglycemia in the absence of diabetes, of blood sugar over 140, and then inflammatory variables, white count too high, white count too low, more than 10% band forms, elevated CRP or procalcitonin. You'll notice that you don't have to have a positive blood culture to diagnose sepsis. I diagnose sepsis in the ER, I never have a blood culture. <clears throat> now, the elements that we use to diagnose sepsis need to be those that aren't easily explained by something else. If I have a patient with a temperature of 102 and a heart rate of 95 and I give them a couple of Tylenol and a liter of fluid and now their heart rate's in the 70s, okay, maybe they didn't have sepsis. You know, it has to pass the smell test. These people need to be sick, you know, to, to, to diagnose sepsis. And also if they have leukemia and their white count's 35,000, okay, we can't use the white count as one of our criteria to diagnose sepsis. It has to pass the smell test. Severe sepsis is sepsis with acute organ dysfunction, hypoxemia, uh, decreased urine output or increased creatinine, coag abnormalities, absent bowel sounds, and ileus is a, is a sign of a GI dysfunction, thrombocytopenia, hyperbilirubinemia, uh, tissue perfusion variables, decreased capillary refill or modeling, and then septic shock. The old classic definition of shock, you, know, you had to be hypotensive for at least 30 minutes, refractory to fluid resuscitation, but now we have a secondary metabolic indicator of decreased tissue perfusion, and shock is a diagnosis of tissue uh, hypoperfusion, not necessarily just a blood pressure. So if the lactate level is more than four, millimoles per liter, even in the absence of hypotension, that supports clinically the diagnosis of compensated septic shock. If you have loved in the past the word urosepsis, we need to have a memorial service for it. Don't ever use it again. It codes to absolutely nothing in ICD-10. Nothing wrong with the word. My ninth grade English teacher would be very proud of me that I could, you know, dissect it and say, well, it's a urologic source that has caused a systemic uh, infection. But there's no code for it in ICD-10. In ICD-9, it just codes to a simple urinary tract infection. You know, somebody calls the office, I'm having symptoms of a urinary tract infection. They phone in three days of Bactrim, say, come see us if you're not better. That's what urosepsis codes to in ICD-9. So, do we need to do any Elizabeth Kubler-Ross grieving over the loss of the term sepsis or, or urosepsis? Are we all, we all okay with that? Now, uh, sepsis versus SIRS, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. In ICD-9, SIRS can either be caused by an infection or something that's not an infection. In ICD-10, SIRS has only to do with the non-infectious causes like severe pancreatitis, tumor lysis syndrome, severe burns, major trauma. Uh, if we think somebody has an inflammatory response to infection, we go old school with the term sepsis. Not SIRS due to infection, but sepsis. If we think our patient's septic, we have to call it septic. Classifications of MI in ICD-10, they're either STEMIs or not. Uh, and there are codes for different uh, regions uh, anatomically and codes for the vascular anatomy when it's identified with uh, catheterization. However, that's different from the way uh, we classify MIs in the literature as either spontaneous MIs, which are the, the classic, you know, plaque, plaque ruptures, platelets activate, plug up the vessel, heart muscle dies. The type 2s are MI due to an ischemic imbalance. The myocardial oxygen demand is higher than, than uh, what's getting it to it, and you can get uh, myocardial infarction 
uh, more on a global scale uh, due to that. Uh, these type 2 MIs tend to be caused in patients that have something else going on. I liken these to you know, a snake coming up and biting you because your, your patient may be septic, they may be uh, hypovolemic, they may be in a thyrotoxic uh, crisis. Uh, or have a tachyarrhythmia, a bradyarrhythmia, something else is going on that's got your attention, uh, but their myocardial oxygen demand is, is greater than, than what it's getting and it can cause myocardial uh, ischemia uh, with infarction. Uh, type 3 MIs uh, with sudden death when biomarkers aren't available, you may have had an EKG with abnormal findings or they may have had symptoms of, uh, of uh, cardiac disease. Type 4 is related to catheterization, uh, A's to PCI, B's to, to stents, and then type 5's are related to cabbage. Acute respiratory failure in ICD-10 is either classified as hypoxic or hypercapnic. In asthma, in ICD-9, classifications were pretty simple. In ICD-10, it's either intermittent or persistent, and within persistent, you have mild, moderate, or severe. And within each of those, it can be uncomplicated, which means they're in the hospital for something else or have acute exacerbation or status asthmaticus. So the, the intermittent persistent uh, categorizes their baseline state and then uh, exacerbations are not. And for those of you primary care, hospitalists uh, will have tables that give precise uh, uh, categorizations of these. Uh, with COPD, if the patient has an acute exacerbation of COPD, that's a, a secondary diagnosis at the mid-level of a CC. Uh, if they don't have an exacerbation but just have COPD and have an acute lower respiratory tract infection, that's a secondary diagnosis at the level of CC. Uh, in ICD-10, there are all sorts of codes for uh, smoke, whether they're exposed, used to smoke but quit, environmental exposure, whether they're dependent or continue to smoke. Uh, but nicotine dependence with withdrawal, if they're having withdrawal symptoms and we note that they're having withdrawal symptoms, that's a secondary diagnosis uh, at the level of a CC. So if we're prescribing Chantix or they're chewing Nicoderm, uh, they're doing that to treat withdrawal symptoms and we get extra credit for that. Acute kidney injury and acute kidney failure are synonymous terms. I used to think, you know, if you had acute kidney failure, they had to be on dialysis, but that's not at all where the line's drawn. You only have to have an increase in the creatinine of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, or if they have chronic disease and chronic elevation, it has to be one and a half times above their baseline. Uh, that's acute kidney injury. Uh, <clears throat> Most acute kidney injury that occurs in hospitalized patients is because of acute tubular necrosis, whether it's because of hypertension or hypotension or, or um, contrast media induced uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, most of the latter goes away with hydration within three days, uh, but when it doesn't, the mechanism is acute tubular necrosis. Now, any diagnosis of acute kidney injury is a secondary diagnosis at the level of CC. But if we can identify the pathologic mechanism of it, uh, whether it's medullary necrosis or, or uh, cortical necrosis or most of them uh, ATN, then that takes it to the, to the level of an MCC. <clears throat> uh, so there, there's a lot to, to, to pull out of our brains. The information is all in there. Uh, but we haven't had to, to document in this sort of detail in the past. So uh, my partner, Dr. Jim Kennedy, uh, who's just, he's genius, he's been doing this for way more than 10 years, uh, created this mnemonic. Now it's easy for us to remember because it's music, we're from Nashville. Uh, M is for manifestations, the presenting signs, symptoms, syndromes, the first thing you see, the first thing you hear. U is the underlying cause. S, we think about severity and specificity. I, the instigating or precipitating causes, and C, consequences or complications. So when we identify con a condition, we plug it into the music mnemonic and ask ourselves about the other components to try to identify <coughs> and link the condition and cause, the condition and consequence. When we can do that, we most often get increased relative weight. Uh, again, it's not a quality of care issue. We're taking care of the patients, same doctors, same nurses, same hospital beds, uh, but we want to get credit for what we're doing. So the most simple example of how this works, uh, just with an abnormal chest x-ray, patient presents with fever, uh, pleuritic chest pain, 
uh, white count and an abnormal chest x-ray due to the underlying cause is pneumonia. So we ask ourselves, do they meet the criteria for sepsis? Do they meet the criteria to identify this as uh, one of the more complex pneumonias? Uh, what was this caused by? Well, perhaps they had a stroke and as late effect they have dysphagia which predisposes them to aspiration and so consequences are complications, sepsis, acute respiratory failure, or empyema. And this will be a solution to a problem that many hospitals are going to have. <clears throat> not, not every hospital is getting this talk, uh, in particular some, some of the small rural hospitals. So they're going to see patients with complex pneumonias that have sepsis, that have severe sepsis, that have acute respiratory failure, they're, they're going to get coded out as simple pneumonia because they don't use the language on the medical record to get themselves credit for it. So those hospitals are spending a lot of money taking care of these very sick people. They don't look so sick on paper so they're not getting reimbursed to meet their, their margins and no margin, no mission. Uh, I don't know if the name Ezekiel Emanuel means anything to you, but he's the brother of Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago. Ezekiel's a physician, very involved in the creation of the Affordable Care Act. He said we expect 20% of hospitals to close. Really? That's the plan? I don't think that's a good idea. But this is how it's going to happen. They're going to be taking care of sick people. They won't be described as sick. They won't be coded as sick. They won't get reimbursed as sick. So let's look at this example of of heart failure as a secondary diagnosis. Now this is just simple pneumonia uh, with no secondary diagnosis at all uh, to add relative weight. Relative weight 0.7, expected length of stay uh, 2.9 days. But let's look at just adding the secondary diagnosis of heart failure. Not in decompensation, they just, they have heart failure. Not history of heart failure, they have heart failure. They're just not decompensated. That adds a secondary diagnosis at the level of CC, raises the relative weight, which accrues to your accreditation of quality of care. You get increased days of expected length of stay, and obviously the reimbursement goes uh, up as well. Some other secondary diagnoses at the level of CC, chronic respiratory failure. Patient presents, you know, and they're trailing their oxygen canister on the little two-wheel dolly and then to the binasal cannula. Uh, that's chronic respiratory failure. For Medicare to pay for home oxygen, there has to be some blood gas analysis out there in the ether someplace that documents hypoxia on room air. So, so I write, you know, di di chronic respiratory failure based on remote blood gas analysis. I don't need to know the number. I don't care when the blood gas was drawn, but I know it's out there someplace because I know Medicare is paying for their home health. And, and, and that makes that diagnosis steadfast and, and makes it uh, hard for the review audit contractor to take it away from us. Review audit contractors make a living by identifying diagnoses on hospital records that they can say, you know, you don't really justify getting paid for that. And they get a percentage of that. That's how that works. Now, uh, the previously aforementioned genius, Dr. Kennedy, has this rule of three uh, to establish clinical validity to make the chart rack proof, make, make it review auditor contract proof. And that's to mention the condition at least three times. If I write in the chart today the word sepsis, the coders can legitimately code sepsis. But if that's the only place it appears, if it's not, you know, in another progress note, doesn't make it to the discharge summary, the review audit contractors are going to say, you don't really mean that, so we're taking that away from you. So we want to mention things at least three times, H&P, progress note, and discharge summary. And because Dr. Kennedy and I are competitively OCD, I thought it would be fun to have three rules of three, so I made up two more. Parts of speech. Uh, the noun is the condition itself. Uh, the adjective something to describe the condition acute on chronic, uh, acute chronic or acute on chronic, uh, linking, I know that's not an adjective, but uh, linking caused by, due to, resulting in, condition and consequence, condition and cause, and then uh, once they're in the hospital, progress, better, worse, same, resolved, and then the, the other part of speech is the verb, what are you going to do about it, what are you doing about it, what did you do about it? And then the third uh, rule of three, once on the problem list, always on the problem list. We want to preserve them for the discharge summary. We want to cite as new any new condition that arises during the course of hospitalization with particular attention to whether or not it was actually present on admission, but it didn't make the H&P. We didn't recognize it at the time. Uh, most importantly, well, I won't say most importantly, but importantly, uh, pressure ulcers. 
A stage one pressure ulcer is just red skin that doesn't blanch when you press on it. And uh, if a stage one pressure ulcer is documented as present on admission, if it worsens during the course, ho course of hospitalization, we don't get deemed for that. But if it becomes a stage three or four pressure ulcer that was not present on admission, that's a, that's a not good. That's a not good. We get, we get dinged for that. And there are many conditions that resolve with intervention and we don't want to forget them. Acute respiratory failure goes away. Sepsis goes away. Status asthmaticus goes away. Status epilepticus goes away. We don't want to forget those things. Acute blood loss anemia. We may transfuse it and they're doing better and we forget about it. We've reviewed charts and the patient was hospitalized for pneumonia. That's why they're in the hospital. And the discharge summary doesn't mention the word pneumonia anywhere. That happens. We want to get in the habit of including all those things. So a lot of this is problem list management. Bundled payments. Okay, we'll finish with this. Uh, the reimbursement environment is changing. In the fee-for-service setting, everybody that is involved in the patient care sends a bill, gets a check. In the bundled payment environment, there's one check. It goes to the hospital or the accountable care organization, and all the stakeholders get a piece of that pie. The size of that pie depends on the accumulated secondary diagnoses that represent how sick the patient looks on paper. Bundled payments are coming in the area of orthopedics, hip replacement, knee replacements, January 1, Pomona Valley Hospital Medical Center. Uh, their reimbursements are going to be based in bundled payments starting January the 1st. And it covers not only the period of hospitalization. In the, the pilot studies, they covered the first 30 days after discharge for those orthopedic procedures starting in January, the first, I think, 90 days after discharge. All the follow-up outpatient visits, home health nursing, and readmissions if the patient has to come back to the hospital, there's no more money coming. And about 15% of uh, joint replacements have to be readmitted for one reason or the other. And so that, uh, that comes out of the, uh, the original bundle. So we may be willing to pay a little more for home health service to make sure the patient's getting their medications up and ambulatory to prevent those readmissions. It's been studied for about three years. Studies have demonstrated that for these joint replacements, they can reduce the expenditures uh, by just under $400 per case, which doesn't sound a whole, like a whole lot, but in 2014, we did 430,000 joint replacements in the United States. So it, it adds up. <clears throat> and they've also demonstrated that the readmission rate goes down uh, when, when uh, people are, are, the incentives are changed and, uh, and a lot of hospitals are, are thriving under the bundle payment environment. It's not doom and gloom by any, any, uh, um, by any form. One of the things that the clinical documentation integrity team does, uh, several things, when our writing is not legible, when we're not clear, when we're inconsistent or incomplete, they help define uh, those things. If I say TIA and the neurologist says stroke, they ask us to resolve those uh, discrepancies. The relationship between the coding system, the CDI system, and the physician is actually mandated by law. Uh, it's part of the HIPAA legislation from 1996. They have, to, they have to do that. One thing clinical documentation integrity is not, it's not about upcoding. That's ascribing to a patient a condition they do not have. Uh, that's fraudulent and that's not what we do. What CDI is is understanding the rules, the regulations as, as we've heard about today uh, and the guidelines prepared for us largely by non-physicians uh, that we're mandated by law to follow. So the doctors are the rock stars uh, but these people are your backup singers. The doctors are the ones that people are clamoring to see but, uh, but they can sure make your record better. This is a, a general equivalence map and this is the last thing we'll mention. In, in hypertension in ICD-10, there's only one code for hypertension in ICD-10. Benign hypertension, malignant hypertension, they code to the same thing. So for hypertensive issues, we need to focus on the end organ injury caused by the hy hypertension, uh, the, uh, the, the kidney injury, the heart disease. If somebody has heart failure, the question is why? If it's, uh, if it's from an MI, that's one thing. If it's caused by chronic long-term hypertension, then we need to link the hypertension and the heart disease and we get extra credit. You know, hypertensive cardiomyopathy or hypertensive, uh, hypertensive heart disease. With each of the specialty groups with whom I talk, we're going to get much more into the clinical details that affect your specialty. We want the size of the pie 
the size of the bundle to be correct. And so this is how we do that. The procedure has its own baseline, but then the secondary diagnosis that we identify that we take care of, we need to document them, uh, not only the fact that they exist, but in the language that gives us credit for them so we can, we can not only survive all of these changes, but actually thrive uh, with them. I appreciate your, your time and attention. We're going we're gonna to get through this. It's going to be good.